So our next uh, speaker is Matus Stergarski from uh, University of Illinois at uh, Urbana-Champaign. Urbana and uh, he will talk about feature selection with gradient descent on two layer networks with low rotation regimes. Okay, thanks a lot, Gal, for introducing me. And uh, thanks everybody for coming, especially people that braved uh, you know, a pandemic and, and these sorts of things. Um, and some of you might be a little concerned if you know that I'm gonna talk about margins that maybe it's weird that I'm before Nati will give a tutorial, but actually it's excellent because I'm not going to, um, I'm gonna use margins as a technical tool. I'm not really gonna to try to philosophically, uh, you know, say they're not really gonna be the goal. I'm gonna establish low sample complexity using margins as a tool. I will not know how to prove these things without margins. So I think it'll motivate you all to learn more about margins and go to Nati's talks tomorrow. And I'd like to thank a few people first. So of course, I'm very, uh, very grateful for being invited again. You can see how happy I am to be in Berkeley. Uh, this still smells like plastic because I literally bought it yesterday in the, uh, in the plastic bag. I'd also like to thank Zhu AG now at uh, Google Research who taught me a lot of what I know about, about margins. And I'll say a couple of his kind of unique ideas today. Some, and there'll be kind of a couple of proof ideas they're his. And I'm very regretful to say that Googling this title gives you back uh, this talk. It is not an archive, despite my promises for about two weeks now. So it's fair game if somebody wants to put up an archive instead of me. I claim I can have it up tomorrow, but but uh, uh, we'll, we'll see. Because um, I will tell you. So I plan to submit it tomorrow morning, which means you can beat me to it. <laughs> right? Fair game. I'm going to show you the proof techniques. So. Uh... <laughs> okay. So here's what we're talking about today. I'm studying two layer networks with the ReLU, and it's very important that it's two layers and that two layers are trained. And I'm going to show low sample complexity, and my proof technique will always be margin maximization. And I'm gonna have two classes of results. The first are gonna sound uh, modest at first until I tell you a little bit of an evil trick. So they're gonna sound modest because I'm going to say that in a way that I'll formally define shortly, the margin I achieve is at least as good as the margin achieved with the NTK. But here are a couple tricks. One, I exit the NTK. Okay, so one of the ways to formally define the NTK is that you stay within Frobenius norm one of your initialization. One of my steps of my proof is that the norm of the first gradient is square root M, the square root of the width. I exit the NTK in that formal definition of the NTK in the first step. So that's one of the twists. The other twist is that, um, Proofs that used margins in the NTK, they could not actually establish that you achieve a large margin. The reason is that the way you measure the margin within the NTK regime is you subtract off initialization. The way that margins are typically used is without the initialization subtracted off. If you do the conversion, you get a one over root M factor on your margin. So with this proof, I'll give the first result that gives a constant lower bound on the margin that you can achieve with uh, to layer homogeneous training or any, any homogeneous training as far as I'm aware, um, prior work gave non-decreasing margins, but they could be arbitrarily small. Like I said, a one over root M factor. Uh, and this also implies that um, gradient flow can select uh, non-trivial KKT points. So there was this question of whether uh, gradient flow just goes to the worst KKT point of the margin objective. And, and in this result, um, I, yeah, I can say that we select better ones. Okay, that's the first class of results. And again, um, they're a little bit modest at first because the margin that I'm referring to is the NTK margin, but then it has these interesting attributes. And in both parts of the talk, for me, the most interesting are the proof techniques. So I think I have not exploited the proof techniques. So I'll spend a lot of time giving them because I think in both phases, a lot of you can do better than, than what I did using my lemmas. So the second class of results, um, they're better and they're worse. So for these, I'm able to prove essentially global max margin results, but they have an almost endless number of caveats. So the first is I'm using gradient flow. And um, for some of them, I can do gradient descent, but a priori, these are non-algorithmic results, right? It takes countably infinitely many steps to, produce, to run this algorithm. And the other is my, my width is exponential in dimension. Okay, so in that sense, it's, it's a negative result. But what I can prove here, one, is there was a, so it's negative result that you showed this? No, I mean, I proved the result, but I'm saying it's negative that my width has to be exponential. So my proofs, in the second half, so the first half, the, it's polynomial in one over gamma, but in the second half, uh, the, 
uh, currently it uses XMesh with, but that is not intrinsically in the proof technique. So I have two results here. One is there's a certain interesting type of data presented by um, Donahoe, David Donahoe and some of his colleagues, they called it neural collapse and basically of data pointing sort of more than orthogonally. And um, so I'm, I'm able to show that if you consider the predictor, which just puts all of the ReLUs pointing in these directions, uh, the margin I achieve is, is uh, at least as good as this one. So I can, I can beat this, which means that I'm doing at least as good as moving all the, rotating all the ReLUs to go in those directions. The second result, um, so what happens here, the difference in this second, in the second setup and the original setup is I've introduced a parameter B, a scalar B. So what's going on here is that my inner layer is not allowed to rotate. The nodes can't rotate. I'm only changing their norm. Okay, so I've removed the rotation. And in this case, I can prove global max margin. And again, a lot of you might be saying, um, you know, who cares about margin? Sounds like a weird idea. There were, there were, there were questions in the last uh, two talks ago when Spencer was talking, you know, when is this condition, this margin condition satisfied? Uh, is it even a good thing to work with? I'm, I'm gonna spend the next two slides justifying, at least for purpose of this talk, why it's a very good idea to, to use margins in the analysis of gradient descent. Okay, but this is the setup of the talk. Are there any questions? And I just want to say that here's a summary of the technical contributions. So in the first phase, I have this root M for BDS norm, which to me is quite perplexing. I mean, by the way, I do SGD. So the squared gradient norm term with constant depth size, the gradient, square, square gradient norm term is order M, where M can be arbitrarily large and SGD still works. Okay, so I didn't have an exploit of this. I, Basically, 99.99% of the time that was required for me to produce this work was finding a certain potential function. 99.99999999% of the time, and I will show you that potential function in full detail on how I derived it. And also, just a last note, in place of the Frobenius norm, I often use this, which is something between the Frobenius norm and the operator norm. There are many results I prove using this norm, which I do not know how to prove if I use it, use the Frobenius norm in place of it. Very technical comment, but uh, it started driving me crazy. Every place in the proof I had a previous time, I'd try both. Okay, so let me show you some pictures. So uh, this is not a talk focused on sparse parity, but especially in light of you know, re recent, uh, recent interest by many authors, uh, I, I realize it's something that can kind of excite a lot of us. So I just wanna say what these results do if we consider the problem of two, two bit uh, two sparse parity. So let me just explain the problem to you. So in all these experiments I'm running up here, I have 64 data points in 20 dimensions. So I'm only showing the two dimensional projection and I'm using width 16, 64 and 256. What's up here plotted right now is 16, width 16. So the data is in 20 dimensions normalized to uh, uh, have uh, be, uh, Euclidean norm one. And the label is just a product of the first two coordinates. Okay, so this is the sparse parity. And just, just I'll throw it out there, the, the global max margin solution in this case is just, you know, you like you, if you can tie your shoes, you know what the global max margin solution is. You just pick four values pointing like this. And it's very easy to prove everything you want about, about that solution. It's just very nice to work with. Okay, so I just wanna, I was very inspired and I think many people have by running these experiments in detail. So let me just show you what I'm plotting here. What I'm plotting are the trajectories of all the values, all 16 of them. They're blue if the outer weight is positive, they're red if the outer weight is negative. Okay, so that if we're getting good classification there, we'd expect all the reds to go along with the red points. And again, it's 20 dimensional data. I've projected it down to two. So the, the, the data points just appear in these two dimensional clusters. Okay, so it's, it's, I mean, we could waste the whole talk just staring at these. Because the first thing you notice is that gradient descent uh, has quite a bit of trouble. You know, like, well, well, this one's, why, why didn't this one go this way? Why, why, you know, why didn't it go this way? And, and why, why is this blue one coming back this way? You know, we, we could do this, we could do this all day, okay? But, but there's a lot of interesting patterns here. I'll just highlight two of them that are relevant to the proofs. One is that the nodes do not move the same speed, okay? The ones that start out pointing in a good direction, most of them go a lot faster. If this plot extended, it goes way farther. So most of the bulk of the Frobenius norm is down to a couple nodes. 
The other thing I'm plotting here is I'm plotting, so I run, I run a lot of iterations uh, and I'm plotting, um, I take every weight, so every inner weight and I inner product it with itself at time zero and time T. Okay, so I see how much that weight rotates and it's normalized. So I do like the Cauchy-Schwartz thing. This should be at most one. And the interesting pattern I observed, which maybe it's reported in the literature, I don't know, but um, as I increase the width, this curve goes strictly up. So all of the nodes rotate less. So at least with larger width, it's not really feature learning. It's more like feature selection. The ones that were good at first stay good. The ones that are bad kind of get ignored. And so that's why I put feature selection tail. Go ahead, Nati. What's the, this one? What's the, what's the spot that means? Yeah, so this one here. So I have, in this, in this figure, I have um, 16 weights. Okay, so I have 16 weights, my inner layer. What I do is I look at the inner layer, every node in the inner layer at time zero. So I normalize it, it is at time zero, and I inner product it with uh, what it's doing at time t. Okay, so I'm plotting this for all 16 nodes, and I sorted, I sorted the output of this. Yeah, so the thing is, is that I ran all of these until I achieved a certain margin. Uh, I don't remember how I picked this, to be honest. It was, I was getting, um, I think I did it based on the test error, but, uh, but then eventually I just, just ended up doing just like 100,000 uh, gradient descent iterations. So the y-axis is this quantity, what's the x-axis? <laughs> yeah, so the x-axis, I have uh, 16 of these, and I'm gonna superimpose the result for 64 as 256, that's why the x-axis goes up to 256. So I have 16, 16 bars for 16 weights. The ones that are blue are the ones that at time t, their outer weight is positive. The ones that are red, their outer weight is, is, is uh, negative. So it corresponds to the colors over here. If we counted the number of red curves over here and blue curves, it would match the number. Of, so yeah, it, maybe it's clear if I, if I do two more steps. Um, so there's the curve. So I've run it with m equals 64 now. And actually this just became really degenerate. It gets really confused. And indeed, you see the fact that it's strictly above the old one. And if we run 64, then we get even this other one. And the margins stay roughly the same units. You see, we could spend the whole talk here. Yeah, yeah. The bars are just sorted by their height. They're sorted by their height, yeah. I mean, but I find this endlessly fascinating. Like by, by like, uh, let's say cookie cutter concentration of measure, you would expect one to be six. You would expect it actually not to have a minimum that's, that's <laughs> so there's like very, very crazy stuff going on here. Did you try smaller than 16? Uh, 16 is the smallest I went um, for a lot of mathematical reasons, but uh, I'll just leave it too cryptically like that. It can fail. It can fail. So it can happen that it just points in the wrong direction and it gets stuck there. So it has happened to me. In fact, I regenerated these for a talk at some point and I put them in the, in the slides without realizing I generated them with a failure and it was pretty funny. Well, everybody happy? What class did you use? Oh yeah, so uh, uh, I have a certain religion. It's called the logistic laws. <laughs> you, you know whether there are KKT points other than this? Uh, yeah, there are tons of KKT points. I mean, it depends on how we want to uh, do the quotienting on the space of KKT points. Because of course, we can like duplicate nodes in either direction and stuff like that. Um, they, there are KKT points where, of course, you just delete certain directions. Um, but but for for uh, there are also these really terrible KKT points that point orthogonal to the two dimensions I've shown. There is a tremendous number of KKT points for this. Yeah. A lot of them are kind of silly for this particular data, but uh, so for those of you that aren't experts, the XOR data is kind of weird because people have proved a lot about it, but in some sense, it's actually very easy. So a lot of the KKT points are silly. Gal's an expert in KKT margin stuff. That's why he's asking. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, I run a lot of these. Um, yeah, there's many more experiments I can tell you about. I've been running these for a couple of years. Um, they're really fun to run. Okay, so, and I just want to flash a slide that's going to give a table of the sample complexities you can prove for this. And again, my main motivation here is actually to set up Nazi's talk. I want to convince everybody that margins are a really good way to analyze gradient descent. Okay, so, uh, and I should apologize. Um, there's a lot of people I'm, uh, leaving off this table, it's 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 just um, there's, there's no positive word for it, just laziness. And there's a lot of people I left off that I shouldn't have left off. But I just want to give a couple of results, and I'll split them up sort of into categories. 
So if you use what I call a perceptron proof or what um, Spencer called a Poyakoyashevich proof, uh, uh, Zoe and I, Zoe G and I, a few years back, we got this analysis. So if you run SGD only training the inner layer, but just straight up single back, single example per iteration SGD, with high probability you can show if the network width is for this two XOR, network width D to the eighth, you need D squared over epsilon samples and D squared over epsilon time to do one step. So I just mentioned that D squared over epsilon is, is optimal for kernel methods. So this is the comment I made during Spencer's talk. You don't lose anything by using margins. So the margin for this problem is one over D and the rate that I'm gonna give you is one over margin squared times epsilon. And that's exactly this. So you prove the general theorem, you plug in a calculation using Gaussian concentration for the margin and you get the kernel optimal you get the kernel optimal sample complexity and the proof is not that complicated. Okay, I think the proof is actually quite fun to do and, and uh, yeah, the proof is, is uh, yeah, I mean, I shouldn't say it's not that complicated because a lot of the key steps were due to Zoe and they were kind of brilliant, but um, especially my newer one is, is actually quite easy. Okay, so I should say that there was a degradation in this proof that um, we got D to the eighth and uh, one of the things I'll show you today is that I get D squared, D squared width. Okay. And that brings the computation down. Uh, just another result. So this paper with like 20, uh, I guess, five, six authors or something, it just came out a couple days ago. Um, so I, the authors I remember, there's Serbi Goel, there's uh, Alain Malach, there's uh, Boaz Barak, Sham Kakade. That, I apologize, those are the authors I remember. Um, so the interesting, so the thing I want to highlight is that for all of these proofs, there's a lot of, there's a lot of trade-offs. <laughs> oh wait, who am I missing? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so the thing I want to highlight here is that there there are a lot of tr interesting trade-offs. So you'll notice that this paper, the highlight of this paper is that its width is very small, um, but it but it's, it's you know its samples and its its computation are are um, are worse than than in the other columns. So the highlight of this paper is this in, is this low width, and uh, I do not know how to prove this low width with the perceptron proof technique. In fact, we have a lower bound for the proof technique, so I do not know how to prove this width there. Um, okay, so yeah, I'm, I apologize. Do you want to see your name out loud? Yeah, <laughs> okay, good result. Yeah, good job. <laughs> but yeah, again, I want to highlight the trade offs. Um, so I also want to say that then there's a class of results that get do global margin maximization over the space of all ReLU networks. Um, and they all get uh, this, this sample complexity D over epsilon. This sort of style of result was motivated by this paper by, um, by Colin Wei, Chiang Liu, Jason Lee, and uh, Tong Yu Ma. And um, yeah, they kind of, I think, highlighted this problem for mar margin techniques that it can get the separation with, with uh, the NTK. And uh, yeah, their algorithm was infinite width and you add noise every single you know, infinitesimal iteration. So it's doing some like non-local search thing. Uh, Chazat and Bach, they used just regular wash sign flow on an infinite width network, but they used one, what I would call super infinite width. So it wasn't just infinite width. They need the nodes to cover the sphere forever. So they need the weights to be supported on the sphere for all times t. So it's not enough to have exponential width at the beginning because then you can rotate away. It needs to be covering the sphere for all times t. And then I had something I'll discuss later called the dual convergence assumption. If there's something that, uh, you know, in terms of like uh, things that frighten me in life, proving the dual convergence condition, that frightens me. So, okay. And then uh, today what I will show you is that with a modified network, the one where I do not let the inner layer rotate, I can get um, also gradient flow, so infinite time, d over epsilon, the optimal sample. So I get the global max margin solution, and I only need d to the d width. Um, but it, but it, um, there's no evidence that the proof technique, actually I know exactly what to improve in the proof to do better than that, okay? So that's the motivation for also I'd say Nati's talk, well, from my taste, like it's good to study margins. Okay, Sonny, go ahead. Well, these are for two, two sparse parities. Two sparse parities. How, what's the dependence of the sparsity? So some of them are, are actually dependent on the sparsity. Some do. Can you comment on that? Yeah. So do you mean, um, yeah. So, so not these questions. I realize I should be repeating all the questions. Is if this was the case sparse parity, how do all of these look? And the unfortunate answer is that I do not fully know right now because um, uh, this this is one of those things that prevented me from uploading to archive. Like I just have not exactly calculated this. So until I've worked out the margin, the margin condition in terms of D and K. So I do not know how these will look in terms of D and K. Right now I don't know. 
but but this one this one is um so this one is I think k cubed d to the two k d to the k that's my recollection yeah. with log factors I'm dropping for all of them and that's the only one where right now I can promise you I know what the dependence on k is. Um, yeah. Okay. So let's uh, let's get on with the proofs. And uh, so the first thing I want to tell you about is the SGD result. The theorem looks like this. And let me just, uh, so I'm being a little bit theatrical, I guess maybe extend the day for all of us. Let me just decide what are the most interesting things to tell you. So uh, I haven't defined for you the the NTK margin assumption. It was in Spencer's talk, but I'll show you briefly. But if the step size is quadratic in in that margin parameter, and um, the width is inversely quadratic in that margin parameter, then basically the number of samples you need for your average to have good test error. So your average test error looks like one over T gamma squared. Okay. Uh, let me just make a quick sanity check comment that if you froze the features and ran, if you froze the features and ran perceptron, like the perceptron proof by Novikov, if you just literally copy paste that, you would get one over T gamma squared. So this, this is tight with that. The improvement over the prior work is actually this. It's one over T gamma squared, not one over T gamma the eighth. Okay. Um, so let me just explain the margin assumption. It was, uh, it was in Spencer's talk. I'll just explain it in a different way. So here's a, another cute way to sort of derive the NTK. So the networks I'm working with are too homogeneous. What that means is if I write out the prediction function on a data point I, which is why I sum J A J this thing, okay? This thing is what's called too homogeneous. That means if I multiply the parameters by a con positive constant C, I pull out C squared. So what that, what that, there's another, there's an, another way to characterize homogeneity, which is that this is actually equal to the gradient divided by two, okay? So another way to look at this is that I have a linear predictor in these features. Now it's a little bit shady because both sides of the inner product depend on W, but I can just decouple them. So you can view the margin assumption as decoupling these. So I, I get a linear predictor, I stick something over here. This is what I get to vary, these are my linear weights. And then I fix these parameters where Ws are drawn from Gaussians. That's another way to interpret the margin condition that Spencer showed us about two, two and a half hours ago, or two hours, ago, three hours ago. Three and a half hours ago. Okay, so there's another way to do it, and that's the margin assumption I use. Let me just decide what interesting thing I should tell you. I have to use the logistic loss. Uh, the proof breaks. The uh, the martingale breaks. Okay, uh, the squared gradient norm term breaks if I don't use logistic. If I use the exponential, the proof breaks, and it seems real. Uh, and yeah, once again, let me just say that for parity, you can exactly calculate uh, gamma. It's one over fifty times d, and I only know it for two two to sparse parity. Oh yeah, and I should say that I'm using slightly PyTorch initialization where the outer layer has variances one over M and the inner layer has variances one over D. Okay. Yeah, what's up? So what's epsilon there? What's the quantifier over epsilon and what's epsilon? Oh yeah. So the way yeah the way to interpret it is uh, yeah I'd, I'd have a table log the other way. So yeah the way to interpret it is given you get you hand me a ah uh, yeah epsilon is like a desired accuracy. I I changed that to trust me. So I apologize. The way it should be written is but given isn't is accuracy the right hand side there? So I'm a bit... yeah the way it should be written is given t. If you give me a t, okay. then I get this right hand side. You give me a t, then with probability one minus delta okay. over the data and over the weights initialization, then I get right hand side, which is one over T gamma squared. Thank you, yeah. Just, just to repeat, uh, there's a spurious one over epsilon that doesn't appear anywhere else in the slide. This is for any T. For any T, but then the probability one over delta is after that. I'm just saying like the log one over delta I didn't deal with. So. Okay, okay. Um, so a few more comments about this. Um, yes, yeah, so the prior work, uh, and it's not just an issue of moving from one layer train to two layers train. After Zhu and I did our, our one layer proof, uh, uh, Chuan Chen Gu and, and, and uh, his, his co-authors, they, um, they adapted our proof to the multilayer case, but they also had the eight in the exponent. So something different had to go on inside the proof for me to get the one over gamma squared. And uh, 
you know, I've only, I haven't really ruled out that I stay in the NTK here, but I'm just saying that the first gradient step has this huge norm. In fact, the square root of gradient norm term, like I said, is order M. My step size is, is, so that gradient term really is order M. So I need something special inside the proof to control that term. I can't just kill it with a step size. Okay. Um, and so I'll just say that the key of the proof, the rest of it is kind of like copy paste perceptron. The really special thing uh, are this inequality and variance that I prove. There's a version of this inequality, which you will see tomorrow, um, which, which actually kind of disturbs me. I proved it in two different ways. It's like algebra that if I massage it around, it doesn't work anymore. Um, so, so I would say the key new ingredient is this margin condition. If you find this proof interesting and how I got the one over gamma square versus one over gamma eighth, um, uh, this is the key ingredient. And I should say, if you're also thinking to yourself, why, why does he care about this exponent? Like who even cares about margins? Um, well, you'll notice that that the work that, um, that that they posted just a few days ago, my computational complexity is higher than theirs with the eighth, and it's better with with the square. So uh, it, it is useful to compare these techniques. Okay. So the the assumption, okay, the assumption is that uh, this infinite width network. So if I do these expectations over these weights, and then I have this like transport thing. So I assign every AV, I give it a direction. This is like my infinite width weight vector. And then I look at the, and this is at initialization. So if I look at the minimum, there, there are multiple ways of doing it. The way I did it for this theorem was, this thing has to be gamma almost surely. So for almost every X, Y, because this, this is a population result. So I need this margin assumption to hold almost surely over the distribution. distribution? Anything, any input distribution. Any input distribution that satisfies this condition. So that you can view this as a condition on the joint probability measure over X and Y. It's saying that the joint, it's saying that, well, if I want to draw it in a silly way, I'd say the joint probability law has to be, you know, has to be supported here, but this is a cartoon, right? Because this is like nearly separable. So, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's a, the, the margin assumption is a strong condition on the joint probability law on X and Y, which is advantageous because that's how it's able to, you know, do better than, than if you did the minimum singular value of the, of the gram matrix sometimes. Ah, and I should say a technical note, this proof, even though this, the sample complexity looks like what you'd get if you applied a margin generalization bound via Rademacher complexity, this proof does not establish that this is a large margin predictor. It doesn't prove that, that you're actually getting this margin separation over the data. It just gives you a sample complexity that looks as if you had a large margin. Okay, that distinction will matter in a few moments. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Hey, no, Audrey. So the previous one, it seems like you're establishing the kind of PL inequality like uh, Spencer was talking about today morning. But uh, given that your weights move so far, could you speak to how to establish that? Oh, um, yes. Yeah, so, so there. So this is actually um, th this is actually kind of kind of crazy. So. Uh, uh, it's actually best if I do it uh, with with the picture, to be honest. Uh, so I use this. So my intuition behind when I got started with this, like six months ago, was that because I used PyTorch initial, initialization, where the inner layer they're all unit norm. So I figured that all of my inner weights can move can move gamma individually. They can all move gamma individually, and if the data is separable with margin gamma, then it should still work. That was. That was my, so a lot of the activations can change. So NTK requires one of root of the activation change at most, but I'm like, nah, gamma fraction can change. My proof should go through. And that was indeed true. So I was saying that my, in Frobenius term, I move this much, and you can interpret this as saying that all of the inner layers are moving by gamma. Does, does that answer the question a little bit? That's the cute answer. The technical answer is that there's a, like I said, there's a variant of that inequality, which, um, if you had me clean and do it on the board now, there's a high chance I would not be able to prove it. Yeah, like three out of five times I try to reprove it, I make an incorrect step, and there's just like weird algebra. It's kind of scary, but somebody else has checked it. So what can I say? <laughs> Any good questions? Any others? I really like the time of this topic, but I should try to not be so slow. Okay, so um, for gradient flow, I have a qualitatively different theorem. 
So this was very interesting to me. I, I could not really do the same thing for gradient flow. So there's a qualitatively different theorem for gradient flow. Might just be my math bug, right? Like I just couldn't do it. But um, especially if you're curious about margins, maybe just for an exercise, you can try to, once the paper's on archive or somebody else posts it for me, you can try to reprove this. So let me just, let me just tell you what's going on. So for this one, I can handle the exponential loss because I don't need to deal with uh, the, the high variance of the gradients. Um, the width is the same. And now there's a little bit of an oddity going on. So the old proof, uh, it started somewhere and it moved some distance. And the distance it moved was at most uh, gamma root m. Now I actually have to move all the way. I have to move up to gamma root m exactly. The reason is that the formal definition of margin is given here. It's divided by the norm squared. Now the norm squared, when you initialize with random Gaussians, has a ton of stuff on the inside, right? It has a ton of random mass. You have to move far to get rid of that massive, that big pile of, of random initial weights. So this proof actually moves sort of um, disgustingly far, okay? Impractically far. This is farther than anyone ever stops in practice. Okay, so here's where things get weird. If I run, um, I'll, I'll tell you how this proved in a second, but if I do a lazy proof, I get gamma squared margin. So gamma squared margin, if you convert it into generalization bound, it becomes gamma to the fourth. So it's worse than SGD. If I do this ridiculous thing where I renormalize the inner and outer layer, so I'm just moving a constant between them. So it's computing the same function. This uh, gets me back to the SGD margin. <laughs> and if I apply a generalization bound to that, now I get back the generalization bound for SGD with like a multi-step weird proof, okay? Again, this could just be my math uh, weakness. So this, this could just be an artifact, but I just wanna say that for now, at least the SGD and the gradient flow proofs are qualitatively different. Go ahead, Nati. Where is in the denominator of the margin is a or the Sorry, in the norm or what do you? Uh, yeah, this is square. This, is the norm squared is written there? Yeah, it's this too homogeneous because I'm in the too homogeneous case. Just to be clear, are you talking about this oh, square? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Because this is the, the, the W, wait, the, the W. W is A comma B, the inner and outer weights. Okay, so, so it's, I see. Okay, so it's yeah, and for so people, and that's why. Yeah, for people that aren't familiar with the terminology, just, just once again, it's I have two layers multiplied together. If I multiply the whole parameter vector by a positive constant, and multiply the entire function by C squared after I pull it through. The, 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 so to get the right units in the margin, I have to divide by C squared. Uh, sorry, what's B I in the definition? Oh my goodness. Yeah, so, so this. This quantity here, yeah, so PI is, um, so this is, so if it's like the tuple A comma B, this is the, like the unnormalized margin. So some J, AJ, sigma, BJ transpose X. And W is the concatenation of A and B? Yeah. yeah I apologize for all of this stuff. Okay, so let me tell you the, what I feel are the interesting parts of this proof. Did I have some other comments? Oh, I, there's, okay. Sorry, no, Audrey, uh, <laughs> good job. Uh, there you go. Um, so um, so here, here are a couple shots for me. So the way this proof works is I use the previous proof scheme to get a training error bound that looks like the test error bound for previous one. It only gives me training error. But if I just hit that with a generalization bound, it chokes. It doesn't give me anything. It suffers from that thing I mentioned earlier that the margin be arbitrarily small. Then to my complete uh, just confusion, if I use my margin maximization proof for coordinate descent from 2013, gives me a margin of gamma squared. Okay, this was not by this was not by construction. In fact, I had a separate proof that was like five pages long, and then I realized I can use my 2013 proof for linear predictors. So I don't I don't understand how this happened, but the proof is like a three liner. So what can I say? This gives this bound. Then um, for this one, you use this reparameterization. And then uh, for, for, the, for, the, for the generalization, I do something I think is uh, very pretty. So there's a generalization bound due to, um, due to Nati Kartik Shadaran from, from Cornell and Abu Chawari at, at Michigan um, from 2010. And they have, a, they have a Rademacher complexity bound that looks like one over N, okay? It's not one over root N, it's one over N. Why do I care? I wanted the same bound for, um, 
SGD and, and gradient flow. That's why I cared about this. Now, the pretty thing that happens is, let me just explain this. Um, let's see. Okay, so I'll do it over. I'll do it over here. So let me just show you something kind of fascinating. So if I look at, um, okay, let me write it this way. So I have some kind of abstract node, which uh, depends on a parameter wj and it's too homogeneous. Okay, I'm mean, dividing by the Frobenius norm. The Frobenius norm squared is the sum of the weights squared. Okay, if I use too homogeneity in the numerator, I get this squared and then the normalized thing, and then this in the denominator. The point is that these things form a probability distribution. <laughs> I'm in the convex hall of single nodes. So I take, uh, so I take Nati's bound, then I take, I guess from Peter's old papers, I take the convex hall rule for, con for Rademacher complexity, and I get a generalization that has no dependence, even logarithmic on the width of the network. Okay, it's pretty, uh, I was kind of surprised by all of this. So I'm surprised both of this is so different from the SGD proof. And I'm also surprised that um, the steps are all kind of weird. But anyway, that's, that's my story for, for this part. Any questions about this? So I did, I did not expect to have to dig so deep and use so many results from, from like, I guess, 20 years of, of, of stuff. I was just kind of in a malaise trying to get pair, uh, same bound for SGD and, and gradient flow. That's an, like I said, that's an open problem. Don't use my my silly complicated proof. Find a just yeah, just find a clean proof. Questions? Okay, let me see if there's anything else I said here. Um, yeah, so this KKT point, I can actually explain this really simply. Um, if I just have two data points, this is proved rigorously, but let me just explain it in pictures. If I have two data points. Just two positive data points, okay? Then, then the max margin Rayleigh solution is just, just one neuron pointing in that direction. If I start to move these apart, and I, they look like two data points pointing far apart, the KKT point at some point the op, the max margin solution switches over to being two values from one. So now you have two KKT points. You can still pick the one that has both data points in the receptive field, or you can have two different values. And um, at some point it switches over. And this proof is already sufficient to pick the two ReLU solution. It's already good enough to pick the two ReLU solution. So it escapes the bad KKT points. I should also say that um, I, I enjoy the papers that people produce that say the word simplicity bias in the title, but I, I find it very difficult to develop intuition about what is simple and what is not. So when it comes down to um, what the global max margin solution is uh, and, and in terms of like number of values and stuff and data with clumps, I find that I'm wrong 99% of the time, and I have to do the algebra to figure out what the actual global max margin solution is, and my intuition for what's simple ends up being false every time. Maybe, maybe somebody else is, is better with the intuition, but, but I'm just saying that it's very hard to argue that the global max margin solution, which it seems gradient flow selects, is, is um, often is, is uh, simple. I mean, that was just like a minor philosophical point. Okay, um, as usual, I mismanaged time. But let me, let me just tell you the highlights in this part. Um, so again, because my results here are to my taste quite weak, I, I will just tell you the weaknesses and also the, the strength, which is the proof technique. And then maybe somebody can use uh, this proof technique. Okay, so now I'm really comparing with a legitimate ReLU network two layer ReLU network. So as I've mentioned, the right scaling on the outer layer, when I write down a ReLU network, I'm competing with this to L1 normalize the outer layer. And then I make all the inner layer weights L2 normalized. So the inner weights all have Frobenius uh, Clinian norm one, and the outer layer, it's, 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 it's L1 norm is, is one for the outer layer. This is the comparator. And why is this a nice comparator? Well, um, the, the global max margin solution for two sparse, like I said, for values, uh, the margin you get is one over one over root D. So if we can prove the same kind of bound we did before of one over gamma squared, we get the D over epsilon. So we have separated ourselves from kernel methods. And this is how all those global max margin papers I mentioned work, going back to the Colin Wei, Cheng Lu, Jason Lee, and, and Tongyu Ma paper. Okay. And again, this is why 
I think margins are cool. It's a refined enough theory that we can separate kernels and, and global and, uh, and, and, and non-kernel methods. Okay. Um, so I will actually skip, uh, I will skip this neural collapse part. Um, this one, I do allow the weights to rotate, but they can't actually rotate that much because if the data has the following form that there's a couple data points over here and in like a cone and all the rest of the data is in the, in the polar of that cone, then if you have a node that points in this direction, its gradient is always is going to be a comic combination of the nodes and the data points in that little cone. It's never going to move away from pointing in that direction. So that's why I put low rotation the title. Uh, th this setting, you can prove that that you get trapped in these in these uh, basins. Um, and the theorem looks kind of like what you'd expect. Um, and uh, that's the potential function. Uh, I will explain it in a moment. I want to spend enough time. I want to skip ahead so I can explain it. Um, I just want to make a comment about this, this joke here. Uh, I'll try to limit what I say here. This is sort of like a, um, for people that work in margins or people that have seen margin papers, often you might see very many incomparable assumptions in the papers, like the weights are balanced across layers or the, or the loss converges or the gradients loss converges. There are all these incomparable assumptions. Uh, when when Zoo and I were doing a lot of these proofs, you'd find that many of them implied each other. There'd be like a graph of implication that all solve imply each other, and papers would just kind of pick one or the other. So we would start when we tried to drop all of these assumptions, we would call it breaking the cycle. So if you just cut it in one place, just find one un unconditional property, then the whole thing would follow. You just get the theorem unconditionally. However, what we would find is that this was typically impossible. So the proof plan of proving the assumptions from those papers. And then just using them as a, as a lemma, we would not be successful. We would have to find a different way to prove what we wanted that didn't use that web of implications. So often that web of implications would just still be open. I'll, I'll make this explicit in a second, but um, I'm, just, I'm just leaving this comment here because uh, if you've been confused by all these incomparable assumptions, that, that's what's going on. There's this like web of implications. Okay, so what I wanna tell you about, and this is where we'll close, is the global max margin result for these scalar networks. And, uh, and then we will stop. So these are the networks where I'm training the AJs and, and BJs and the VJs are fixed. So I, I, I fix them. And the way this game is gonna work is that there's some, good, there's some good global max margin predictor. And basically what I wanna argue is that if a couple VJs, if I, have a, if I sample a couple values close to those good global max margin solutions, then I want to make a potential function that says all the mass, all the Frobenius norm mass the network concentrates in those good directions, and then I prove max margin. Okay, that's not my proof technique. That's what Chazat and Bach did in their, in their old paper. Uh, that's my game. And if I do that, if I can succeed in getting the global max margin up to a constant, use uh, this, this generalization done by Nati, I can get the D over epsilon for, for, for two parity. Okay. Um, so, let me just explain you, I think there's nothing, oh yeah, I wanna say this model is similar to this model by Nati and Surya and, and Blake Woodworth and colleagues that they call diagonal networks. It's somewhat similar to that model. Eh, I was inspired by you guys, so whatever, it's similar enough. <laughs> so, um, so I want to explain the potential function. Um, yes, yeah, so I wanna explain the potential function and how I came up with it because I realized in, proof, in constructing this potential function, it caused me to unify many papers. So I, I want to tell you guys about this because it's something I learned that is not stated in any of the papers and is maybe more valuable than, than what I actually proved. So again, I want to show you how many different proof techniques and many papers are actually the same. So there's a very actually kind of amazing, the more I thought about it, I realized this beautiful assumption in the, in the original gradient descent max margin paper by by Nati and Daniel Sodrian and Hoffer and Nexon, they had this assumption they call almost all. Let me explain it in my own words. So the technical version of the assumption is that the max margin direction, um, if you look at its support vectors, their affine hull has dimension D minus one. Okay, I don't know about you, but to me that sounds a little, uh, that's like hard for me to understand. So here's a picture. So here's the max margin direction. We're in the linear case right now, sorry. We're in the linear case. And here are all the support vectors, okay? 
These are data points such that the inner product with the max margin direction is, is that fixed constant gamma. And we need the max margin direction to be in the interior or relative interior of that convex hull. Okay, why does this matter? This is why I like this assumption so much. For me, this is a very nice intuitive way to understand why logistic regression maximizes margins. If we did a W that starts going away from the max margin direction, if you look at the data point in this convex hull on this boundary that's the farthest away, it's gonna pull you back over. Okay, so if the max margin direction has data points all around it, the farther you get from max margin direction, those data points pull you back towards it. There's like a certain strong convexity over that orthogonal hyperplane. Uh, and I, I actually used this intuition and not the intuition from my, from my proofs before to, to develop my, my new potential function. Okay, so th this at least is how, how I, I visualize, is this fair? Do, are you okay with <laughs> Is this not what you guys said? <laughs> I should say that the first the first I heard this was was not by looking at the paper. Um, so Zhu AG actually found the paper and read it and told it to me. So this is his version, but he he said it. He gave you guys full credit. He said it was your guys' your guys' idea, but he gave me this proof that I think is not in your paper. Which uh, this 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 is pretty awesome. So his proof technique says if your weight vector WT, if it's projection onto the orthogonal complement of the max margin direction, okay? If you're pointing far away from it, so if this is large, in other words, if WT projected here is large, then if you just look at DDT of, this, of that thing squared, it must be negative. Okay, let, let's just say it again in words. If, if you're far away from max margin direction, then your derivative project onto that hyperplane must be negative, which means it can never be that large because it has to go back down. Okay. There has to be like a, a, like a fixed point. There has to be a point where it cannot get above because it's a contradiction. It can't, it, you can't be above that point and have a negative derivative. Or let me say it like maybe in pictures, if your WT projected onto this, this uh, convex hall is getting farther and farther from you, there's kind of a limit after which you, you can't pass because the derivative on that plane would, would be negative. And, and, and the, the proof, by the way, that Zoe has, it's in one of our old papers. It's very short. It's just like algebra. It's kind of, kind of brilliant. It's completely his. It's, I didn't have any role in that proof. And um, it actually reminds me of another old idea because I've just been throwing around a lot of old ideas. There's a proof by uh, Phil Long and Rocco Servideo about convex potential boosters being sensitive to noise. And they, they, they had a very different construction, but it had a similar intuition. These are like, they call them poolers and they kind of pull you back. Okay, just throwing out a lot of, uh, yes. A lot of older papers. Okay, so now, uh, so I'll tell you how to translate this into two homogeneous networks, and then and then we'll stop. So another way of writing this, if you just expand the square, is you get the first term and some cancellations. So there's W T, which is um, yeah the norm of all of your weights. I mean right now it's a linear case, but just think of it as all the weights, and then you have the projection of W T on the good direction. What I spent almost all of my time working on this project doing was trying to understand what the projection of the global max margin direct solution is onto your architecture. I was trying to understand how to generalize this projection to two homogeneous networks. And for those of you that have not seen this before, um, okay, let me, let me do it this way. I'm gonna show you a few expressions that are gonna have problems then I'll tell you how I fixed them with the potential. We won't have time to understand it because of my fault, I mismanaged time. And then we'll stop for questions. Let me show you something cool. So if I just look at DDT of my parameter vector squared for a two homogeneous network, you can just calculate this out. You, you use some chain rule, right? We get two, the parameters and the parameter time derivative. If you work this out, I get the derivatives of all the losses, W, I mean, that's, not really a gradient, but I'll just call it a gradient. And um, if you use homogeneity, you get uh, this. Okay, so this thing um, kind of looks like the margin. Now, the problem I encountered when I tried to do this over on the other side was that this thing scales with norm of W squared. And what I would get in the other term when I would try to adapt it to 
to two homogeneous networks is um, if I had like multiple different directions and I was trying to figure out, let's say the, how much the network is fluctuating in different directions, they always be scaled by these norms. So I couldn't really relate them back to the original global max margin direction. There was this, there was this imbalance. And so to fix it, let me just give you one more technical idea. If you look in the papers of Chizat and Ba and a paper by Kaifeng Liu and Jian Li, they have a solution to this problem. So what Chizat and Bach did is they look at this weight ratio. And when you DDT the weight ratio of two different nodes, you normalize the output of the node by its previous norm squared. You make it have like the order of the margin, you make it like constant order. You, you cancel out its, its, its norm. So that was one solution with Chizat and Bach. They did this DDT of this ratio. And, and Kaifeng Liu and Jian Li, they did something similar. They looked at the log of the weights, which similarly kicks down the norm. Okay, so, so what am I telling you in so many words? Because I know I'm not being that coherent. All I want to say is this potential is a nice way to kind of move back to the max margin direction. Two homogeneity has this scale issue I couldn't figure out. And one solution is to do these ratios. Um, that's not the end of the story. The final potential I worked with, uh, did I even put it in this? Yes, it's, it's, it's a monster actually. It's, it's this thing. And we, I think it'll just be a waste of time. I think it'll just be ugly if we, we try to go through it. But the, the, the bottom line I want to tell you is that, um, yeah, how do I summarize this coherently? Yeah, there, I'll, I'll summarize it this way, that if you try to design such a potential function that does this projection of the global max margin solution onto your network weights, the issue you run into are all these imbalances. This is like that cycle problem I talked about. I couldn't figure out how to solve it, but I figured out a potential function that sort of just removes them. And this potential function has every magical property that proves the theorem, <laughs> which is not very satisfying for the person to talk, but uh, yeah, I'll just, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, let me actually just go back to the theorem and explain the theorem, and then uh, we'll stop. Because yeah, I was too ambitious with time and, and is explaining the proof. So I will just say that, um, yeah, the point is I have these scalar networks, okay, and they can prove Global max margin. Oh, I should say, what is the closest prior works? The closest prior work is either the paper by this one by Colin Wei et al., uh, Colin Wei, Chang Lu, Jason Lee, and, and Hong Yu Ma that I mentioned. They have to use this noisy Wasserstein flow. Um, they can't use gradient flow, but they get global max margin, similar result. Or the result by Chizat and Bach that needs the infinite support, the infinite width plus, plus the um, uh, dual convergence. And um, yes, yeah, so this gets a comparable result uh, just with these scalar things. So the next op the open problem, of course, a lot of inner weights to vary, which I think that's why I want to show the potential function. I think it'll help with that, but I, I ran out of time. So let me just summarize and then we can stop. I apologize that I not handle the last 10 minutes that well. So just to summarize and just say what I think are the most interesting points. So two layer networks train both layers. Uh, the first proof is this, uh, what, what Spencer was calling Poyak Wojasiewicz style or what I call perceptron style. Um, and I guess what was exciting here was that if you look at the width and the sample complex we need for, for this two sparse parity, it's, it's, it's very tight, it's very good within the, within the NTK. Um, the width is, is worse than theirs. Um, and this is already enough to say that we get non-trivial margins and, and escape these KKT points. So that was the first part of the talk. To be honest, stronger than the second half. The second half just looks hard. Um, and the second half was some cases with global max margin. And I would say um, open problems, just to give people something to think about for the first part, a very direct open problem once I post a paper is, is to make SGD and gradient flow closer. Like I think it's a good way to actually explore generalization bounds. Why did I have to use such a complicated proof to get a good generalization bound? And for the second part, it would be to, um, one question is to drop the, the VJs not rotating. And I'd say a second open problem is to um, make, make this more practical. So if you have a very small width, what, what happens instead of this ridiculous, you know, C far dimension is 3072. So uh, yeah, having 3072 in the exponents, uh, not, not great. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you.
you say and what like what you're what you're doing with the potential function that you do define? Is it, is it you're showing that it's what it's um, no, I, I can I can I can there is actually a clean thing that will that will not take too long. Okay. The way I want to do the proof that mirrors the proof that I showed you is I want kind of your current, oh, and this mirrors the Chizot box. Okay, I want to be able to say that your current margin minus something like your projection. So I want this projection to scale with gamma. And what ends up happening is you have a potential function on the left that's what you can prove is lower bounded by zero. This part goes to minus infinity. If, if, this, if your margin is always worse than the optimal margin, then this goes to minus infinity. So I need to exhibit this. How do I exhibit this? The most naive way is you get an expression that looks like if you have these clusters of nodes that point in the same direction as the global max margin direction, I get a sum over these clusters, and I get I get um, my my margins on, on those points. Now the problem is that this scales with the amount of mass I have on that node. So if I have some node that it just happened to happen happen through random aspects of training that it just the weights were just huge and then there was another one small i mean intuitively should fix itself right gradient descent will just say oh you don't need to train these anymore go in this direction but in the proof it becomes a disaster you have these imbalances and now i can't relate this school max margin that's why using this log is magical it normalizes this and it balance it balances the weights within the proof so so this is the key thing my my potential function for each cluster of nodes that point in one of the max margin directions so i have all the nodes that point in that in that direction I take the log of that sum, <laughs> and then I sum over the clusters outside the log. So it's like a product of the sums. <laughs> and don't even ask me how I found this potential function. <laughs> okay, sorry that took longer. But does that make at least some sense? I mean, I, I can tell you offline too. I'm not sure. Thank you. Uh, such an outside you're uh, welcome to all oh, welcome to join uh, enjoy whatever it is they set up <laughs> uh, we'll uh, resume tomorrow morning at 9 30. Right. Uh, yeah thank you <laughs>